is good. God is good. And his mercy, it endures forever. And the kingdoms of this earth belong to God and his Christ forever and ever. Amen. And if you believe that Jesus is the son of the living God, you believe the right thing. Amen. Amen. Your belief system is founded. Amen. On the right thing because Jesus is the Christ. Yes, I know that the world would teach you that Christ is his last name. That's actually not his last name. No, it's actually no, his no. title. <laughs> he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the everlasting. He is the bright and morning star. He is Alpha and Omega. Come on, somebody. He Amen. is the fairest of 10,000. Amen? Amen? He is. He is your Savior. He is your Redeemer. He is your Healer. Hallelujah. Your Baptizer. He is. Amen? Hallelujah. So if you believe that He is the Son of God, you believe the right thing. Amen? And Romans teaches us, so the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in Romans teaches us that if you confess that, that he is the son of the living God. If you confess that, the Bible says you're saved. Oh. Hallelujah. I, you know, sometimes you almost wish that God would make it really complicated. <laughs> like you had to climb to the top of the Himalayas and fast for 40 days and chant for a couple of years. And then maybe you might get into the good graces. No, no, no. He made it easy. He sent his son 2,000 years ago to die in your place on the cross. And Jesus took all the sin of all humanity all at once. Yes. And he defeated all of it. Mm. Oh, what a champion. Oh, what a savior. He did it all in one afternoon and went into a devil's hell and in three days paid the penalty that you couldn't pay in eternity. Hallelujah. And rescued you. Rescued you. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we have the privilege then to study his holy written word on a Friday night. Amen. The anointed word of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit has been uh, not dealing with me. He has been asking me to reemphasize that the word of God is anointed. That it is God's presence. When you open up the word of God, you are in the presence of God because it's his word. Amen. And everything he is, he breathed into that word. Praise God. Hallelujah. And holy men wrote it down as they heard it. And therefore, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the word of God is alive. Hallelujah. And it is active. And it is powerful. Yes. Yes. And it is capable of changing your physical body. It's capable of changing your circumstances. And all you have to do is add mustard size seed faith to it. Faith that you have to squint at even. And every one of us has been given that measure of faith. And the word tells us. Hallelujah. That not only have we been given the measure of faith, but if that will exercise our faith, it will grow. Hallelujah. 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 So, we want to welcome all of you that are joining us out there on the various social media platforms. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's a privilege to open the Word of God and to expound Amen. upon the Word of God. Uh, we're believing, God, that you're being ministered to right where you're at as we're being ministered to here. But my goodness, His presence is like a blanket in this place tonight. His, his presence has mantled across my shoulders once again, and uh, I'm excited that his presence is here. And so we want to invite you to come out and join us Amen. here on a Friday night or on a Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. At 28 Chapel Street, beautiful downtown Wallingford, Connecticut. <laughs> Glory to God. We'll make you feel most welcome. Amen. 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 And so we have been looking these last several Friday nights at the topic of prayer. Amen. Uh, it is foundational, it is elemental to the Christian's life, right, that we pray. Uh, but 
uh, there are several different types of prayer. Amen. The scriptures are very clear. Our foundational scripture found here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul writes this in 618. He says, praying always. Ephesians 618 says, praying always. Praying always. Praying always. We don't have to go any further. Praying always. When should we be praying? Always. Always. And if we break always apart into the compound word that it is, we should be praying always. So it tells us there are many different types of ways to pray. And if we use another definition of always, it has the definition of time. We should be praying all the time. And you say, gee, Pastor, I'm a little confused. How can I pray all the time? I'm glad you asked. See, most people think that you have to be down on your knees. Now, that, that's, this, don't get me wrong, that's a good way to pray. I pray that way often, right? It reminds me to humble myself. Amen. Am I talking to the right group of people? Amen. It reminds me to humble myself. Amen. And who am I speaking to? God. And who am I having a conversation with? It reminds me there is a holy God to be reverenced. Yeah. Amen. Right. Uh, hallelujah. Glory to God. But I can be driving in my car and pray. Amen. Amen. I can be walking. The 120 pound Rottweiler, the terror that he is. And I can be praying. Amen. Amen. I can walk around our property and pray. I can be sitting at the kitchen table and pray. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Absolutely. Yes. You can pray anywhere. Amen. Amen. The, 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 the key that unlocks heaven. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. And I am immediately at the throne of God. How do I come to, to my heavenly father? I can only come through the shed blood. Yeah. Amen. So, in the name of Jesus, I've just entered into his presence. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so we looked these last several weeks at all the different types of prayer. We saw that there's a prayer of supplication. It's a prayer that changes things. We saw the prayer of faith. It's a prayer that changes things. We saw a prayer of commitment where you're taking... Uh, all of your cares and you're committing them to the Lord. We saw a prayer of consecration. Amen. Where you're consecrating yourself to the will of God. We saw, come on, help me out. We saw intercessory prayer, didn't we? we did. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, the last several uh, times we've been together, we started looking at the different uh, components or different elements of prayer. And uh, we said this to you. Right? I typically don't teach in a series like, you know, the five keys to or the four things that, right? Because I don't know everything. So there might be more than five keys. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Right? But we saw, we saw that the foundation for all prayer, whether it's supplication or faith or consecration or commitment or intercessory prayer, the foundation of all prayer. Somebody say all prayer. All prayer. Is love. Is love. I remember that. Amen. It's love. The foundation of all prayer is love. And last week when we were together, oh boy, we had time, didn't we? We saw that boldness. Yeah. Boldness was another component or another element or another foundational block of prayer. Amen. That Jesus, even teaching on the subject of prayer, when his disciples asked him, right, teach us to pray like you pray. He, he taught them uh, out, of a, uh, out of a parable, right, which is um, a story that will drive one specific spiritual point home. And so he shares this parable of a man that went to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night and said, I have some visitors. Uh, give me, I have nothing to feed them. Give me something. And the man inside the house says, listen, everybody's in bed. Yeah, come on. Mama's sleeping, baby's sleeping, go, go away. Right? And the Bible says, I'm just saying the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says 
The Bible says. The Bible says. The Bible, God speaking, says, nevertheless, because of his importunity, that's a little blind to us in modern vernacular, because of his boldness, because of his unblushingly forward request, amen, that man will get up and give him everything that he desires. Now, we know that's a parable because, uh, listen, God is never behind a locked door, and God never sleeps. The point that Jesus was driving home is that boldness, come on, yeah. is an elemental foundation for prayer, right? Yes. We serve, if you don't know, <laughs> I said if you don't know, we serve a really big God. Yeah. He stretched out the universe, the Bible says, like somebody drawing back a curtain. The Bible says that he holds all of the oceans in the palm of his hand. And I find it very, very interesting. The Bible also says that your name is engraved in his palms. Amen. A big God has got your name right there, Beverly. Right there. Look, look, Beverly, right there. Woo! Right there. Big God has your name engraved in his palms. And the Bible is very clear to us. There's nothing too difficult for him. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I hear people, you know, sometimes we have to minister to folks and they say, you know, the doctor said impossible. Come on. The doctor said it can't be done. Well, I'm glad you said the word impossible because it puts you right into the wheelhouse of my heavenly father. Amen. Amen. Ha hallelujah. Glory to God. And the Bible teaches us, as we saw last time, let's just do a little highlight reel here. I like doing highlight reels because good teachers are redundant. I said good teachers are redundant. I said good teachers are redundant. Good teachers are redundant. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. That the Bible says that when Peter and John were arrested at the temple and then jailed overnight and then threatened to teach and preach no longer in the name of Jesus, the Bible says that when they were released, they returned to their own company. And the man who trained me for ministry, that was one of his favorite phrases that he would say. I can hear Brother Hagin right now in the pulpit talking about, there's something about returning to your own company. Something about getting around people that believe like you believe, and talk like you talk, and pray like you pray. There's something about returning to your own company. And the Bible says that when they returned to their own company and shared everything that the Jewish leaders of the day had said to them, and all their threatenings, they decided that they should pray. Ha hallelujah. They prayed. And you know what they prayed for? Boldness. Boldness. And the Bible says that not only did God hear and answer that prayer, because they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And began to boldly proclaim the word of God, so they got an immediate result. Amen. But the Bible says that the place where they were gathered was shaken. Mm -hmm. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe what the church needs today is a couple of more shaking yes. encounters with God. Yes. Prayer meetings mm -hmm. that make so much power available. Yeah. Like was available last night. Yeah, come on. So much power available that the place where they were gathered was shaken. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. And so I want to continue along these lines. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit to keep moving along these lines. And uh, I titled the teaching Elements for Prayer. Elements for Prayer. We've looked at some foundations. We've looked at the different types. You know, we said this to you when we began teaching this, that the different prayers, uh, some of them have different principles or different precepts that you have to apply to them in order for them to work more effectively. Amen? Like if you're praying the prayer of faith, faith comes by knowledge. I mean, where faith stops, knowledge stops. Where knowledge stops, faith stops. So the more you know about your Heavenly Father, the more faith you will have. That's right. Right? That's, that's, that's just biblical truth. Yeah. The more you know Him, the more you trust Him, the more faith you will have. That's just the truth of it. Okay? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Mm -hmm. That's the truth of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. But uh, we use the sports analogy. You know, if 
you have, you have football and baseball and basketball. You cannot play football using basketball's rules or principles. You cannot play tennis using baseball's rules. You're not going to get a good result. And so we said this to you, right? The only time you see in the Bible where Jesus prays, if it be your will, is in the prayer of consecration. When he's in the garden, it's the only time Jesus said, if it be your will. And what was he praying to God about? Right? If you can get this cup to pass from me. In other words, if I don't have to go to the cross, if I don't have to be crucified, if I don't have to be whipped, if I, listen, if I don't have to take this cup away from me, nevertheless, your will be done. So he was consecrating himself to the will of the Father. Amen? If you pray the prayer of faith or a prayer of supplication, which is by design to change things, and you end that prayer with, if it be your will, all of a sudden you've added a badge of doubt to it. You've added an element of doubt. Well, I'm not too sure if you want to heal me, God, so if it be your will. Right? And some people use that as their kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card. Because if it doesn't, what happens if it doesn't? Oh, yeah, what, you see, what happens? You know, what happens? You know, but we know what his will is. His will is for us to be healed. Amen. His will is us for, for us to be well. His will is for us to be whole. Yeah. Amen. He is a good heavenly father. He's a good shepherd. Yes, Amen. And the flock should, should represent or reflect the good shepherd. Amen. You know, my people are off the boat from Ireland, and, and you know people's cattle in Ireland or people's... Uh, uh, sheep in Ireland, if they're not cared for, it, it, it shows up immediately in the animal. You see it immediately, go, wow, that's a bad farmer. You can see it, a bone sticking out of that, not being fed properly. Amen. I saw this, uh, you know, sometimes you get caught on these videos online. Dear Lord in heaven, I was watching this video the other day of a wild sheep found in Australia. He was a wild sheep. Listen, he had been out there, it's, he got out of the pen. The shepherd let him go. And apparently the shepherd never went to go find him. Right? And I, they called him Fluffy or whatever, or Steve, I don't know. Here's what I know. He had wool upon wool upon wool. I mean, he was just this big. He couldn't even see. All you see was a little nose coming out. Right? The wool had grown up over his, he couldn't even see. Right? And so, of course, the first thing they do is they shear him. And all of a sudden, this, you know, they put a little blanket on him because, you know, after years, it doesn't take years to grow that kind of, and they put a blanket on it. I mean, he's just sitting there in his little pen, and he's eating his hay. He's like, oh, yeah, look, you're not carrying that weight anymore. Well, listen, administer to me. How many Christians go through the, the call? Oh, I'm going, going through a dry season, Pastor. Oh, but, you know, it's just, it's just I'm in a dry place right now. Uh, you know what? Sounds to me like you got out of the pen. Help me preach this. Sounds to me like you were in the sheepfold, right? And you had the good shepherd. He was taking good care of you. We decided... Well, I mean, it's so, so good that we go wander out here in the wilderness, and you can't figure out why over time you're getting heavy and burdened and laying down, and you come back to the shepherd, and he's so good that he removes all of those burdens off you. I'm talking to somebody yeah, good tonight. Yeah. Removes those burdens and brings you right back into the pen and feeds you good hay. Yeah. Amen. The church of Jesus Christ, the ecclesia, we should be a reflection of the shepherd. Come on, healthy, wealthy, bold. Come on, we should be just like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was poor. He was? Let me see. When he was born, three? No, it wasn't three. It doesn't say three, does it? It just says wise men showed up and gave his family so much gold that they were able to live in Egypt for two years. And then move back. Do you ever hear of Jesus' family having need of anything? No. Hmm. Did you ever hear of Jesus' ministry being in need of anything? No. No. Uh, you know, the Bible teaches us that Judas had stolen 30 pieces of silver out of the money bag. Well, listen, if you've got one coin in the bag and it goes missing, right? You're going to notice that. Apparently, 30 pieces could go missing and nobody noticed the thing. Right? It was Judas accounting. <laughs> Dear God in heaven. Anyways, how did we get off on all that? He is a good shepherd. 
and he takes good care. Say it out loud. He takes, he takes good care of me. Good care. Hallelujah. He takes good care of me. Glory. 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 Hallelujah. So uh, elements of prayer. Elements of prayer. And this first element is fervency. Fervency. A little blind to us. But if you'll hang in there, we'll get there. James chapter 5 and verse 17. You've heard me uh, speak this, uh, say this, quote this often Thursday nights before we start prayer. The effective, fervent prayer, James 5.17 says, of a righteous man avails much. And goes on and describes in verse 17 that Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed earnestly. Somebody say earnestly. earnestly. See, earnest and fervent are the same. They're synonyms. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. The effectual fervent. I don't know about you guys. When I came into Christianity, amen, way back then, 1995, all I wanted was something that was going to work. Are you listening to me? Yes. And, and, I, and, and, I, and I, I, I just wanted something that would work. <laughs> right? Now, I mean, I had been raised in a denominational church and I had never really seen prayer. Come on taught from the biblical perspective, and I certainly never had seen answered prayer. Right? It was just like you were kind of like throwing darts up to heaven. Maybe one of them would get all the way to the throne, maybe not. Who knows? But when I read in the Bible that my cry, glory, comes to his ear, and God said, if you'll come in the name of Jesus, your prayer comes, help me preach, or help me teach. Somebody just say, help me. <laughs> your, your cry, it comes right to God's ear. Nobody had ever taught me that. That when I pray, he's listening. And he's hearing me. What I had been taught is that, well, maybe he hears you. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe you're just a terrible sinner. Come on. Yeah. And as long as you're a terrible sinner, he really doesn't have a whole lot of time for you. Am I, am I talking right? Because when I read the Bible and I saw that Jesus hung out with sinners, I said, there's something wrong with this movie. If God has no time for sinners, what's he doing hanging out with them? Huh. He came to save sinners. Oh my! <laughs> Tells me that he showed up just... For me. Yes. That makes me pretty special. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Fervency is earnest. It's heartfelt. Romans 5.11 says to be fervent in spirit. To be fervent in spirit. And you go, well, I still don't have a good definition. I'm glad you asked because the Passion Translation says in Romans 5 and verse 11, for fervent in spirit, keeping your passion towards him boiling hot. Somebody say fervent, fervent. Is, boiling hot. is boiling hot. Well, wouldn't that change how you pray? If you know that Elijah was a man just like we're men, you know, mankind, you're a woman, right? It, it, would, would that mean that your prayer life would be like, oh, well, you would do what it does. <laughs> Or would you be going, oh, God? Oh, would you be fervent? Yes. Boiling hot. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And likely provoking yourself and stirring yourself up as you're praying. What? To be fervent. I want to be effective. I want to be, the Bible says, the effectual. Fervent. Well, when I'm praying for someone, I want there to be an effect 
on them, and I don't want to wait until next Tuesday. I want there to be an immediate effect. Amen. What happened to you last night? You put your hand on my shoulder, and it's and now it's fine. It, it's been. I didn't know her shoulder was bothering her, but we're in prayer, and I just happened to put my hand on her shoulder, and God healed her. Amen. Are you listening to me? Now, I can't do it because I have nothing to do with it. I, so I can't go, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. He healed her because the Bible says that when believers lay their hands on the sick, the sick recover. Listen to me. Can I add one word? Immediately. Amen. Immediately. There's an immediate change in someone's body. And immediately the power of God is made available to that individual and all they need to do is cooperate with it. Amen. Hallelujah. Sure. Boiling hot. So, the effective boiling hot prayer of a righteous person avails much. One translation says, the Amplified says, makes tremendous power available. So imagine one boiling hot Christian getting with another boiling hot Christian and getting with another boiling hot Christian and getting with another boiling hot Christian. Do you think you might start effectively and effectually changing things that you're praying about? Yes. That was a little weak. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yes, is the right answer. When we were praying for our young people on Sunday, going back to school, do you believe that God has his hand on them? Do you believe, right, that the blood of Jesus is protected? Do you believe he's given his angels charge concerning them? That they'll be kept back from accident, harm, death, destruction? That they'll never know the taste of drugs or alcohol. That's right. Right. Amen. Or is it, oh, you know, if it be your holy will, just keep them off of drugs, God. Boiling hot. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, is talking about a certain person that's with him named Epaphras. And he says here in 4.12, Colossians 4 and 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ. So somebody say, he's born again. He's born again. And he's spirit-filled. And he's spirit-filled. Greets you. Hallelujah. Epaphras, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you, in prayer, that you and this is listen. This is this is his fervent. Somebody say boiling hot. Boiling this hot. is his boiling hot prayer that you would stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Do you think that that would be a good pray, prayer for the church to pray for one another? Yes. It would be, wouldn't it? Because we are the ecclesia, we're the called out ones, right? And the epistles are written to the church, and so here we have. The Apostle Paul is saying that Epaphras is laboring for you in prayer. How and why? Well, that you would stand perfect in the will of God. Ah, hallelujah. Folks, as the pastor, you can pray that for me anytime. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Desire. How am I doing? I'm doing good. Desire is the next element that I want to explore. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. Nevertheless, God, that comforts those who, that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. I need to talk about Titus here for a minute. And, and the Apostle Paul, and the relationship that the early church had, that the church of Jesus Christ should have today. The Bible says that Titus came and comforted the Apostle Paul. And how did he do it? Well, he showed up. <laughs> I, 
you know, in, in today's society, and I'm not going to rail against today's society, but you walk up to somebody's front door and you haven't made the arrangement to walk up to their front door, you might get shot <laughs> through, through the front door, <laughs> right? And, and, and we are the most connected society in the history of societies. We have more ability to communicate with each other and around the globe than has ever existed before, and never have we been more isolated. Yeah, that is so true. Technology has isolated yeah. us, where we have forgotten how to sit down mm -hmm. and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just watching an interview this afternoon, a group of people, and they were talking about um, Generation X, is the, the young generation that's in the earth right now, and how they don't like to talk on their cell phones. Right? So, so the young people's age back there. You see, you can't see them on camera because you know they're back there. <laughs> Amen. Gen Y, Gen X. Uh, listen, it doesn't really matter to me. The point that they were making is that most of them would prefer that you text them. Yeah, yeah. They do not want to speak to you. Amen. They don't want to answer their phone. They don't want to talk to you. Just text what it is you want, and they'll text you back. And you know what's happened? We have forgotten how to communicate one with another. We read emotions or we read scenarios into a text or into an email even that doesn't exist. Oh, they must be mad at me. Look at the, uh, uh, well, no, no, there's no this and there's no mad emojis, no mad face on that. I don't know, no frown. Huh. Are you mad at me? <laughs> right? Whereas if they had picked up the phone and you could hear the tone in their voice, mm -hmm. you'd recognize, no, they're not mad at me at all. Mm -hmm. Are you listening to me? Ha, hallelujah. They say, and this I happen to believe is true, I'm in sales for a living, 70% of your communication is nonverbal. 70%. See, it's a good thing that as a pastor I'm not moved by some of the faces I see. <laughs> Body language. <laughs> right, because I, I, I listen. I'm trained to read all of that. Right, <laughs> people come in and you can see the corner of the corners of their eyes are pulled down, the corners of their mouth are pulled down. Right, and what it tells me, and actually this works for me in ministry, they're going through a rough time, and they're not communicating, and they're not saying, oh, you know, but but their face is telling me there's something wrong with the movie. Their body language, there's something wrong with the movie. You start ministering. I don't want to pick on anybody. But you start ministering. <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's this telling me? Nothing. <laughs> it could be that it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there it is. It's cold. It's cold in here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there are some folks that, you know, that they, they don't hide at all. Right? You're, <laughs> you're ministering, and they're like, <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for his word. Amen. Amen. Desire. Nevertheless, God that comforts those who are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire of your earnest desire and your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoiced even more. Desire is an element of prayer. Psalm 37, verse 4, most of you probably can quote it to me. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in him. Now listen, I, when I was putting my notes together, I was like, you could preach just that. You could teach just that when it comes to prayer. Really, Pastor? You can't? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. You ready? Delight yourself. The only way you're going to delight yourself is by spending time with Him. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you're coming into the you're, you know into into His presence every morning with your prayer list and you're rattling off your prayer list, right? We as a body of believers, especially in this hour that we're in, need to understand.
Jesus above all. Yeah. Jesus said, I'm your shepherd. You're my sheep. My sheep know my voice. And you say, Pastor, I don't know his voice. It tells me that you're not spending time learning his voice. Yeah. Listen to me. There's This is not... God has never done anything easy bake. There's no easy bake oven with God. There's no microwave. This is done over a lifetime. This is a lifetime of discipline. Yeah. Amen. Getting quiet. Mm -hmm. Putting your prayer list over there. Yeah. Telling your mind to focus on the things of God. And getting in His presence and allow Him, as we were talking about last night, and allow Him to love on you. And you'll recognize his voice. When I'm in prayer, right, I know when the Father enters. And I know when Jesus enters. They have different personalities. I know when the Holy Spirit enters. Can only, listen to me, folks, it can only be done over time. Amen. And it is a discipline. It is a lifetime. Right? Because, let's face it, we live in a world that is designed to distract you. Right? And one of the reasons, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm just going to go ahead and go there right now. One of the reasons that we don't hear the voice of the Lord like we should is because we're too often in the mental realm. We're too, our whole lives, we're engaging our mind, which, by the way, is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Right? But if you're always living by your mental realm, when you get into God's presence and you enter into the spirit realm, your mind is going to want us to keep doing what it does. And you have to train your mind. Shh. It's time for you to be quiet. Even as we're ministering along these lines, his presence is just roll back in here again. And some of you are sensing his presence. And it is quiet. It's quiet. When God steps into your space... There is a quietness and an assurance. That's how I sense his presence. There is a quietness and assurance. God is here. Woo! That's for somebody. Amen. Desire. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. Getting to know God through prayer and spending quiet time with Him is what begins to birth in you what God is trying to get done in the earth. And He will not force Himself on you. He will not force you to pray. Amen? He will not force you to spend time with Him. That's what the devil does. <laughs> That's what demons do. The devil is a driver. The devil is a controller. Demons are drivers. They're controllers. Yeah. Amen? And God, the most powerful being in the universe, is always a gentleman. Always. Amen? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, be determined to respond to the Spirit of God. Respond to urges to pray. We don't hear much of that anymore. I began thinking about this. We don't hear much of this anymore where a minister will say, I have a burden to pray. Or a Christian even, and in Christian conversations, talking with fellow Christians. Yeah, I, you know, I have this burden to pray about or a burden to pray for. Right? We received a burden to pray for this upcoming election. Right? Last year. We were burdened to pray. I was. That's, that's where we ended up going. Amen. Hey. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Do you think there was a good reason to be burdened to pray? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Is the, is, is the United States of America heading in a right direction? No. no. Right? Was it heading in a right direction with, with Mr. Trump at the helm either? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ish. Ish. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> right? Yeah. Ish. Right? There is, there is, there, it, it, I, you don't hear it anymore. People, I, I have a burden to pray for the country. And God said, I looked for a man to stand in the gap, and I couldn't find one. Well, where is he going to find somebody to stand in the gap for the country? 
Do you think it's going to be in the church? It is, isn't it? It's going to be in the ecclesia, the called out ones. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, we don't, and we, I, we don't hear this, yeah, I was burdened to pray. And sometimes when that burden comes on you, sometimes it, it can be on for a minute. Sometimes it can be on for a week. Come, come on, a month. Until you pray it through. Well, that's another thing we don't do a whole lot of these days. Brother Hagen would talk about going visiting somebody in the hospital and praying for hours in the Holy Ghost next to their bed. Hours. Listen, I've got four minutes and a little oil. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to say in school, if, you know, if, if, if the church had its way, the, the pastor would have a drive through window on the side of the building. He'd be, Shanda, you're healed. And Shanda. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Desire and getting to know God. Getting to know his presence. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Amen? Sometimes there is a leading. There is a burden. And we have to learn how to be more sensitive to him. Sometimes we're so insensitive to what he's saying to our spirits because we live in the mental realm. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the man who started Teen Challenge uh, back in 1986 was out to uh, breakfast with another minister. And uh, at the table, he said this to him. He said, I see a plague coming on the world. And on the bars and the church and the government will shut down. This is in 1986. The plague will hit New York City, because he has started Times Square Church in New York City, and shake it like it's never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and across the world. Hallelujah. We're here. Amen. We're here. Prayer changes things. What's the desire of God's heart? That everyone get born again. Yes. That everyone get filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. That everyone start growing up. Everyone. I mean, imagine. The whole earth gets saved. And we enter into the millennium. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. Sounds good. Can you imagine? for Wallingford and the 47,000 souls that are in Wallingford. But why not the state of 3 million? Yeah, come on. Huh? Why not the whole region? Why not the country? We're supposed to be running the show down here. We're supposed to come on. The church is supposed to be exercising authority. We're supposed to be driving out sickness and disease. We're Come on. We're supposed to be going into enemy-held territory. Come on. Strongholds that Satan has sat on now for a hundred years, two hundred years, and drive him off. There is no one on the planet who's going to do it except the church. That's right. <laughs> we're not this weak. <laughs> Come on, we're we're part of the toughest gang in the universe. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. That's right. Amen. You listen to me. Yeah. Right? Because, oh, and, and, you know, the people talk about how divided and this and the politics and this. And then, listen to me. It's not political to pray for the country we're supposed to. That's right. Yes. God said, I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. For what? Because Israel had sinned. And God kept extending mercy, and kept extending mercy, and kept extending mercy. And he was looking for someone to stand in the gap because judgment is now coming. Right. Will someone stand in the gap for the country? Will someone lift up the leaders of the United States? Will someone pray for the church? What? 
that they would be perfect in the will of God, yeah. that they would be sincere and without offense and walk worthy of the call. Yeah. What? Yeah, every Christian is called. And Colossians, that prayer, it's a Holy Ghost-inspired prayer that Paul writes in the beginning of Colossians. That you would be sincere and without offense and walk worthy. This business of offended Christians is offensive. <laughs> you got to show me in the Bible where you have a right to be offended. If you're dead to sin, then you're dead to offense. Anyways, I better stop. I'll start meddling. Glory to God and perseverance. Perseverance is the last element. Perseverance, I shouldn't say last element. It's what I have next in my notes. I think there's more coming. Perseverance. Do you remember our foundational scripture there in Ephesians 6, 18? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. Persistence is a foundational element because it's easy to throw off the burden and forget it. Wilfred Reed, uh, a, a remarkable Bible teacher who married John G. Lake's daughter, said it like this, it's an awesome responsibility to feel that someone's life may depend on your intercession. Not many believers are willing to accept it, so, they're, so those that are willing, you stay with me, those that are willing, to intercede on behalf of someone or a country or I, many of them are usually kept very busy. Yeah. The devil comes along with busyness. So, you're burdened to pray but you have work to do. You're burdened to pray but you have a life to live. Stuff is happening. Right? When I get burdened to pray I, I wrote down two examples. I'll just share one with you. You good with that? Yeah. Uh, in, in my company, and most of you know this who call Faith Bible Church home, there's a lot of upheaval, right? And one of the best managers that we have in our company was fired. And he happens to be one of, one of my people, one of my guys. Loved him. He did everything and anything he could to see to it that our customer base was taken care of. And over paperwork or not reporting or whatever, he was let go, right? And when I found out that he was let go, the first thing, because it landed on me like a ton, because he's a good guy. I don't even know good people. Yeah. Right? Just, you know, th this shouldn't happen to good people. Yeah. Right? Turned to the city and said, listen, I need to get some agreement. Right? Because it's just, it's just landed on me like a ton. This is a good guy and this shouldn't happen. So we agreed that he would land on his feet, that he would find the perfect job right. that would bring glory to God. That would take advantage of all his skills and talents and abilities. And that would pay all of his bills. Would be a good, high-paying job. Right. Amen? And listen, life is busy. It's busy. The phone starts in, in my world at 6.30 in the morning, sometimes ends at 6 o'clock at night. It's busy. It's constant. But over the course of the last several days, since I found out that this has happened... I get this, it's right here in my heart. It's just, oh, Lord, thank you. It's a burden. Thank you. I'm not here because we're, we're broadcasting, so I don't want to, but thank you. He's going to land on his feet. Thank you. You're ordering his steps in a perfect job. Thank you. And then one day in the middle of the week, it was, it was early in the morning, and I came out of prayer, and I shot him a text. Listen, bro, I just want to let you know I'm in your corner. Right? And that's good. And I said, and my wife and I, are in agreement that you're going to find the perfect job and it's going to be a high paying job and it's going to bring God glory come on Amen. and it's going to take advantage of all the skills and the talents and the abilities that God has placed in you can I get an amen, amen. right 30 minutes later amen brother he received it listen to me as surely as God made little green apples as surely as the wheel spins on an axle, he's getting a good job. Amen. Amen. He's going to land on his feet. And what the enemy meant for evil, to drive him even further away from God. God will overstep and bring glory to himself out of the outcome. Amen. 
what am I saying to you? It does, I listen, I understand that when Burton's come and you don't have time to go find yourself. You know, listen, you, you, sh you should, if you can, go find a quiet place and pray until the burden lifts. But when you get those gone, just, you know how to pray now. Yeah. Come on, you could be driving in your car and the Lord just puts somebody on your, on your heart. You go, okay, let me pray for them. Oh, God, thank you that they are perfect in your will, that they walk worthy of the call, that they are sincere without offense. That's not complicated. And it's Bible. And it's fervent. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Stand your feet, everybody. Let me pray for you. Yeah. <laughs>